Professor, I begin at the beginning. Um, I read in one of the accounts of, of your life that you talked about that you were, you said, I think in your early years, you were most academically influenced by your parents. So if that's uh, still true in your mind, but let's just start with your childhood. Let's maybe at eight or 10, um, what are your curiosities? Where are you living? What, what is life like? Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure it's really my parents as much as like my family, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's your family we're interested in. Uh, or maybe I was influenced by my parents in, in not the most natural way. <laughs> Let us find out how. So you're eight years old. Where are you living? Uh, so uh, I come from Damascus, Damascus, Syria. It's yes. uh, in the Middle East. It's the capital of Syria. Um, when I came to MIT as student, people I would tell them I'm from Syria, and I was like, ah, this is in Europe next uh, to uh, Serbia. Uh, I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> this is in the Middle East. Right. And uh, now, unfortunately, people know Syria for the wrong reason. Yeah, because of the sadness. Yes, and the refugees and the war. But at eight, it was a good life? Uh, at eight, I, I had, uh, yeah, a good life. Um, I, I come from a family that is very interested in, in science ah, and um, knowledge in general. So even at a very young age, I mean, I knew about MIT and it's like, oh, maybe like I would want to be at MIT. At and, a young age? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this young, I, maybe? I, I can't really tell with an no, age no, or like, but at a very young age, I knew about like, okay, so MIT is the best engineering college. I would like to be there. But at a young age, what did you know about yourself and your interests? Uh, uh, you went to school, of course. Yeah. Uh, were there directions that were interesting to you? Were you more interested in certain subjects than others? I loved math uh, a lot. Um, I loved also science. I, it was, I wasn't like only good at one thing. I was that, like I was good at math, I was good at science, I was even good at history. Yeah. <laughs> you told me that you are in history. Um, so I, I really, I think I was driven by curiosity, like I, I, I oh. liked learning in general and figuring out things. That may be a constant among the people I've interviewed, this, this statement you said, uh, driven by curiosity. Um, your household is what, many children? Uh, are you an uh, only child? Um, yeah, I'm the eldest child. Eldest uh, child, okay. If, uh, I have two sisters. Okay. And um, my family, actually, it's, um, I come from a family of medical doctors, so my... Both uh, sides. Uh, not my mom, but also my mom's family. My mom is a lawyer. But, uh, yeah, so everyone in the family just was expecting me to be a medical doctor. And, uh, in fact, uh, in, in my country, in Syria, uh, it's very different from the system in the U.S. Okay. So um, after high school, we all take a national exam and we could we get ranked across the whole country. Mm. And uh, the the top people uh, can choose, and the the very natural choice for everyone is to go to med school. Uh, this is sort of the top. Yeah, inspired yeah, 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 yeah. So actually, actually, Syrian doctors are pretty good. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, so I, uh, I took the exam and I scored among the very top in the whole country and yeah, everyone expected me to go to med school and indeed, because they're, everyone good, like, yes, yeah, it's a natural yeah, go to ambition. med school. So I wanted to go to engineering, but engineering was not as good in Syria as the med school. So I went for one year to med school. I'm not going to let you get to be so old yet. I see. Because I, see. I want to know in, uh, for example, high school, uh -huh. um, the direction of your education, whether there were teachers that were particularly encouraging. Yeah, so um, uh, in high school, I would say, I mean, they were a good teacher, but I mean, I'm not the type of person that I can tell you that I had a role model and yeah, just like, I, I didn't have that. I just like what, um, and I think to some extent, I, I never like when other people say, oh, I have this role model, even outside the teacher um, community, it's just, I really wanted to be myself. I didn't want to be like anyone else. Oh, okay, um, that's very interesting. Uh, can call you self-directed pretty much. I mean, you, you come from a family of educated people, so you have books, you have 
the yeah. ambition, but you are pretty much conducting your own direction. Yeah, and even maybe in excessively, I, I just didn't want to be like other people. Yeah. And that probably one reason you stopped me, but one reason why I probably even switched from med school and wanted to do engineering so that I'm not like the rest of the people, or I'm, I'm not following the, the expected path. Right. How um, prepared were you? Because we're going to put you in medical school before we get you out of it. <laughs> so you were well prepared, the school was a good one? Um, so um, in Syria actually is a very, um, like people in the US don't know much about Syria, probably now they know that it has a war and uh, but it's, uh, it's an interesting system because if, if you look at high schools, I mean, the good high schools in Syria, actually they're very good. The, 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 the education up to the high school, I would say it's one of the best and huh. it's, um, it prepares you much better to, to college than I see here in the U.S. Huh. Okay. Um, and it's, it's very intense. I mean, many people find it very difficult also. Um, and then after that, unfortunately, the, the college, colleges and schools uh, are not the same level as we can find in, in, in the U.S. and um, developed countries. So the, the most intensive, excellent education is happening through the secondary level? Yes, yeah, up to high school. Up, up to and including high school. Including high school. Including high school. Um, I'm going to ask maybe too obvious a question, which is that, is there any distinction? You're set on a career in science. After all, your family also has traditions of science. Is it considered unusual that a young woman wants a scientific career, or is the system gender neutral in thinking uh, about It's this? much more gender neutral than here in the U.S. Very interesting. Yeah, so again, up to and including high school. Right. Um, like I, I, I really get shocked when I hear here I hear people here like young uh, girls saying, "Oh, mass is for boys." Or you go to these mass camps, you see that there are very few girls and, and mostly boys. Um, yeah, in Syria there is no such thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. In, in fact, it's a very different division because it's it's an underdeveloped country and money and resources are very important. So mass is considered to be like if if you are interested in mass, who, who's gonna like make money for the family? Who's right. gonna provide for the family? Right, right. I understand. Yeah. So you you have the right family to be established in an intellectual career. You have a good education. <laughs> Um, now I let you go to medical school because that's where people are expecting you to. Uh, why don't you stay in medical school? Uh, so I liked medical school uh, and actually I, I, I was a topper of my batch mm -hmm. and um, then I decided I, I just can't, this is not me and I want to do, uh, I want to continue learning more about math and engineering and physics and stuff like that. and. I just not gonna be a doctor. So and I'm sensing that your parents want what you want. So they're not saying to you, "Oh my God, this is a disaster. You have to stay." No, in they said, "Oh my God, you are an idiot." Oh, they did. They did. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so after, they did not encourage this decision. No, no. They, they were particularly my dad because he, he he's a doctor and yes. <laughs> he wanted his uh, eldest daughter to be a doctor, a medical doctor. So he, he didn't talk to me for two years afterward. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's not encouragement, that's <laughs> discouragement. Um, but you were not discouraged. No, no, I am. Um, for, for bad or good, I, I, I like to do things that are different. Yes. And uh, so, and it was a shock, actually, it was, I mean, it's a, it's a very small thing, but it was a shock actually to the whole country because <laughs> Nobody in Syria get to med school, top uh, yes. that, and then abandon it. And abandon it, yeah. That's like oh, that's that's news in Syria. <laughs> but your decision is not against an academic life; it's against a medical life. You 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 know you want to do something else. Uh, it's not against med school. It was really that I, I just couldn't imagine that my knowledge of math and engineering would stop at that stage. So how do you solve this? What do you then do? Um, so at that time, I mean, of course, I, I wanted to, to, to go to, to get at that time because my, my second language 
uh, is French. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to go to France and uh, do engineering in France. Okay. Uh, but uh, um, since my parents were <laughs> against it, yes. it was very, very hard to do that. So I switched to the engineering school in Syria. Um, it's um, the electrical engineering school. And this is also a distinguished opportunity. I mean, the, the, it must have been a good medical, a, a good engineering school, or maybe not. <laughs> let me let me understand what kind of a school it was. Uh, so it's um, it's not a good school. <laughs> Okay. So when I got, and again, I mean, just like not so that people would not take it against new students who are coming from Syria now because there are new, a new university that opened up in Syria since I left. And, uh, yes, so, but this was your yeah. time. But at my time, it was only, actually, there was only three universities in the whole country. Okay. And the biggest one is Damascus University, and uh, it had a, a wonderful med school because this is where all of the toppers go right of and uh, really not as good uh, engineering departments uh, so switching this is why like it was a shock to everyone that somebody who, who is in med school and doing very right. well would just uh, switch well i would be concerned as your father too yeah okay but, <laughs> i can but, understand him now. but you were you were you were determined you were the engineering program was how many years? It's uh, f it's uh, in Syria. It's five years. Five years. Yeah. And did you go through the entire five year? Program? Yeah, yeah. So I did the five years, and then I applied uh, to schools in the U.S. But in the five years, how did you d determine a specialty in engineering? So. Uh, so when you join, actually you join a specific department, like as opposed to here at MIT, when a student comes, the, the first year they just do basic classes. No, in Syria you very early on choose. In fact, you choose math school, you don't do pre-med, you just choose ah. math school. Okay. Uh, so when, uh, when I joined the, that uh, particular engineering school, I, I was in electrical engineering. And you had earlier read and thought in, in those terms? in electrical engineering? So, uh, again, also at the time, there was no computer science uh, department. Okay, so, important. electrical engineering was kind of like, you can think of it as computer engineering. I see. I yeah. See. And that you knew you were interested in? Uh, I, I knew that this is the closest to what I was interested in. What was your experience with computers? I mean, the availability in other schools or your home, um, how, how able were you to use it to your own satisfaction? Um, I, I mean, I, I was like any kid at that time, like I had my own computer, I would write my own programs and just like experiment with things, write games and stuff like this. Um, I think I found just like computers and programming languages very natural. Yes. Yeah, so as opposed to, to many people just like, I guess my brain is like very, uh, works in a very declarative way. Right. So I found these like languages and being very specific and doing writing in that particular way very natural. Just to pause for a moment with the opportunity we have now, this is 20 years after that, at least 20 years, yeah. 20, 23 years. Um, as you look back at that stage of knowledge about computers in the context, does it seem to you very primitive, what was known and thought about? Uh, again, you have to put things in context. I think Please. it's in context of the, the place more than the time, I think. Okay. So, although actually also the time is relevant, but basically at that time in that place, computing was really about programming. Um, that's how, how people in Syria perceived it, at least at that time. Yes. So algorithms, complexity, all of those things were just like something that you... I mean, complexity, of course, nobody talked about complexity, but you, you design an algorithm, you don't even talk about the algorithm, you, you just talk about your program. So in that sense, a, a simpler stage of, of yeah, possibility. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 not as much into the the deeper, more complex connections of um, 
entities and modules exactly. and the algorithms that we talk about now when we talk about computer science. Well, you, you graduate, my guess is, with distinction. Yeah. Again, I topped that school. Yeah, good. <laughs> That was easy, actually. Cause yeah. <laughs> and so now um, you, you're set upon a career in some form of engineering or computer. Um, so you look around the world again, before you looked at France. Uh, what, what sets you on the goal of coming to MIT? So at that time, I, I applied to like uh, a number of what's considered top schools, and of course MIT. As I told you, I mean the, the name of MIT, like multiple of people in my family, my my great aunt will always tell me, "Oh, you are where well, you do math, you should go to MIT." Oh, really, really. Uh, and Harvard and MIT, the two names that comes right. like people who who are interested in business will tell me about Harvard. People who are interested in engineering will tell me about MIT. But yeah, I, I knew about MIT, I wanted to, to, I wanted to come to MIT, but at that time just applied. Uh, and I was actually shocked that they accepted me. Really? Yeah, if I, if I knew, uh, if, if, I, if I were a professor and knew what I knew as a student about my university, I would be very reluctant. Huh, and of course, or not of course, but uh, it's a real question. There was nobody on the faculty of your engineering school who could send a letter to a colleague at MIT and say, this is a good student, you should so, be looking at them. So you, you are asked as a student to, to, to have reference letters. So I asked some of my professors, right. they wrote letters. But now seeing, seeing things from the other side, I mean, I know that when we receive letters, we ask like who are those people writing exactly. those letters? How much do they know about our system? Exactly. Stuff like that. So I, I, I really appreciate that MIT took a risk on me. Yeah. Um, since I've never applied to MIT, I don't know, do they ask you to present yourself with a particular problem that you want to solve? Or, you know, in the humanities we do essays and that's the way they guess at the ability. Did you have to present a concept or a direction? So you write a uh, statement of purpose. You describe okay. what you have done, your interests, stuff like that. So I guess at that time I wrote about like uh, the, the one year I did in med school and then my engineering career and my interest in, in combining uh, knowledge in medicine with knowledge uh, well, in engineering. Well, this is an important point. So you hadn't entirely abandoned medicine as one of the elements that you might affect. Sure. Um, so they're intrigued and they let you in. <laughs> okay. Um, you come, are you terrified? Are you confident? Um, how do you experience that initial master's level of uh, education? Um, so, I really loved it here when I came. I, I loved MIT as a graduate student. I still love it, but it just um, it felt finally um, in the land of nerds. Yeah, <laughs> it just yeah. feels very natural. Like when you are, like <laughs> before, I was with more normal people. It just felt <laughs> different. Right. Uh, and also MIT when I was a student was way more nerdy than now. I mean, <laughs> now it's more normal. Um, but yeah, I, I really liked it here. When I came, because, so my native language is Arabic yes. and my second language is French. French. So when I came here, I really knew very little English, English. actually. So oh. I discovered that just nodding and smiling can take you a very long way. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so the first year was... Also, one of the things that is very difficult for somebody coming from Syria, as opposed to, to many of underdeveloped countries, right. is that even math in Syria is taught in Arabic. So the symbols and it just, yeah, which is very different. I mean, I, I can't even think of any other country where even math is taught in, in, in their native language. language, even the symbols. So, right. so even when I see an equation, like, I don't know, uh, integral, for example, is a different symbol. Yes. So it, uh, it was a pretty steep learning curve. Sounds terrifying, <laughs> actually, although you're in nerd heaven, but still, to have to relearn a symbolic language as well as 
in everyday spoken language, you had some English, of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, thanks to the movies. That's a... Yeah, yeah. But uh, nevertheless, so you have to catch up in a way. Yeah. Maybe that's a good phrase. So you have to catch up. Uh, the master's requires how, how long before it, it's awarded? Is it a year? Uh, no, master's uh, at MIT is two years. Two years. Yeah. Okay, so you have two years, I don't say to prove yourself, but to become comfortable in this new uh, language. And I'm always interested in the points when one is making intellectual decisions. So here you are at MIT, you have the banquet. Uh, what do you choose as a direction? Yeah, so I actually remember that when I first came for my visit day at MIT, I met with Professor Eric Grimson. So Eric uh, was my academic advisor. As a right. student, I was matched with him as academic advisor. And I was sitting in his office and he told me that MIT is like a candy store. So <laughs> And the real problem is not really to, to find the candy that you like. The, the real problem is really to not try to eat all the candies. Oh, well said. Yeah. So, which candy did you choose? So, when, uh, so I chose uh, Computer Networks. Uh, it was a time when the internet was uh, really growing and things were happening and uh, I mean that's before the uh, the bubble burst right, right. Uh, so it, it was a great time for the internet what, what is the year um, so uh, when I came to MIT it it was uh, I don't remember I think it's not end of 96 okay just late 90s la la yeah late 90s, late 90s. Yeah. Um, and so the internet is in the air, and but you have to have you have to choose courses. You have to find professors to advise you. You have to decide yeah. on a thesis. How do you do it? Uh, so I just followed my guts basically. Yeah? I okay. I like the topic. I um I started working with um in a group uh, of internet researchers here at MIT that has uh, David Clark and um, John Kolowski. So John was my master's advisor, David Clark is my PhD advisor. Okay. And I, I worked with both um, very, very smart people actually. It's, mm -hmm. um, I think it's really um, affected my career Working with them, not just in knowledge, but also like uh, seeing how they think. Yes, their approach. Yeah, yeah. The questions they asked and so forth. The question they asked and they, their approach to science. What what does it mean to, to to work on a problem? How do you pick your problem? That's that's actually even more important than your solution. Ah, okay. Um, that that seems quite important to register. Uh, what is your thesis going to be about, or what does it become? So my PhD thesis was about congestion control in the internet. Uh, so um, if you think about the internet, it's, the internet is a network. So I mean, the, the closest analogy is to think about transportation networks. Okay. So if you send too many cars to one location, then you get congestion. And in the internet, when you get congestion, packets are dropped connections uh, stall, uh, applications don't, uh, user gets upset. So the question is how do you control congestion or um, first you want to try to avoid congestion mm -hmm. and if it happens, how do you control it and you recover from it. And what was the contribution of your PhD to this solution or yeah. this strategy? So. Uh, so that goes back to, I always like interdisciplinary research and uh, I think one of the things that was special about my PhD thesis is that it, it tried to take concepts from control theory, uh, which were not at the time used in the context of the internet, and uh, try to integrate them with protocol design for the internet. So this is your insight, the, the bringing together of these, these elements. Of yeah, yeah. 
Because the internet is a very, very complex system. So um, most of the uh, control theory or the designs in control theory are designed for things that you can characterize and has way less uncertainty than you have in the internet. So typically the design of the internet or protocol design has avoided uh, these oh. more um, very uh, sophisticated mathematical models but also they, they, they have certain requirements that seem to be very hard to fit within the, the amount of uncertainty and distributed nature of the internet. Well that there is no that. single control point. I mean, we all contribute traffic to that internet right. and we all, all of our machines are different control points. Yes. Um, are you as, I'll use the word blessed, in uh, colleagues your own age as in the professors that you have, are you finding people to work with at your own at your own PhD level? Uh, yeah, I think I, I was blessed in, with my colleagues in uh, various ways. So when I came to MIT, I um, I became a very close friend with my office mates. Oh. Um, as a result, so my office mate was a Chinese woman, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, I came, I didn't know English much, so much mm -hmm. of my English is learned from a Chinese woman. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I have now this weird accent that's just like a combination right. of weird things. Uh, so I, I was really blessed to be with, um, with those office mates that, that, I, that became my best friends. And we, we are in the same field, we work together, we, we travel together. And this we, continues as a, a cohort uh, of, of people. You, you continue intellectually and personally. Yeah, yeah. So, so at least throughout our graduate career, okay. we were together. Afterwards, I mean, every person uh, went uh, to a different state. And, some, and for, for this uh, Chinese woman, she went back to China. Uh, but yeah, like uh, throughout my graduate career, I, I was very lucky to, to have them around. You've completed your PhD. It's, I'm going to understand it as a, uh, an interesting com combining of, of certain elements that had not been thought of together. Um, what happens next in your career? Because I don't think you ever do wind up leaving MIT. Uh, yeah, so... Um so at the end, in my last year, when I was about finishing my PhD, I, um, I actually n never before wanted to be a professor. Okay. Also interesting, yes. <laughs> yeah, because also it has to do with my roots coming from Syria. I mean, a professor in Syria is... Um, so, like, professors don't make any money because, I mean, yes. education is not really imp that important in right. Syria. So, um, so professors are not considered to be the smartest or even the most knowledgeable or the most academic, uh, or they typically don't do research. So I, when I came, I, I didn't want to be a professor. Right. But then, uh, so after my graduate career here at MIT and like seeing science and interacting with a with professor here, I, I decided that I'm interested. But I actually, yeah, I, I wanted to stay at MIT. So uh, I talked to another person that you interviewed, uh, Barbara Liska. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I told Barbara that I would apply only to MIT. And uh, that I don't, I'm not interested in any other school. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not applying to any other school. Why would I apply? And then Barbara said, if you don't apply for, uh, for, to other schools, we are not going to take you at MIT, even if you are interested. Wow. Yeah, so, and then Barbara made me actually apply to other schools. <laughs> so, so I applied, but I, I, I really was interested only in, in MIT, and I wasn't even like, um, I didn't know what I'm going to do next. I was just like, okay, so I'm about to finish, and they told me that I should apply for a job, so applied. <laughs> let's let's um, stay at this point, and I'm going to ask a very general question about what are your ambitions at this point? I mean, I understand the question of, of the position of a professor in Syria as opposed to here, and, but are you interested in, are you entrepreneurial? Are you interested in possibly attaching yourself to a corporation? How are you thinking about your so, future? 
My ambitions were and still have nothing to do with the name FYID. Okay, so I want to do something important. I want to introduce new ideas, new concepts, and I want to see those concepts making impact. I don't care whether I'm a professor or I'm uh, an entrepreneur or I'm, oh. that, that never was the case. This is why I don't really care. And so the question is, where can I make the biggest impact? Yeah, yeah. Not I want to go to the corporation or the university Exactly. Or like where can I think about new things and have the, the opportunity to push them to, to make the maximum impact? So you apply, forced to do so to many places. <laughs> As it happens, MIT, which is probably her intention anyway, accepted you. Uh, and what kind of program are you accepted into as a uh, an assistant professor? What is the the level? Yeah. So when when you join, you join at the level of assistant professor. Assistant professor. So you are an assistant professor of what and where? At MIT. Uh, so MIT has one department for electrical engineering and computer science. So yeah. I um, I was given an offer to that department, which is the same one from which I graduated. So you're still there. Yeah. yeah. So, so it was the right choice on both sides, um, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, that said, actually during our so we have faculty lunch. Okay. And the first time I came to the faculty lunch as an uh, sorry a professor. Yeah. Professor, actually nobody knew me. <laughs> it's like, oh, where are you coming from? <laughs> like, no, I was here, a student at MIT. Hmm. Um, is there a lab associated with now the work you're planning to do, or is it yes? So yeah. So, you... so again, that goes to how MIT is structured. So right. um, there is the electrical engineering and computer science departments. So, so that is a department, and then there is a computer science lab. Actually, at the time it was um, so now it's called CSAIL, as computer science and artificial intelligence lab. But when I was first when I first joined as uh, an assistant professor, there were two labs. There was uh, the AI lab. Which actually happens to be the lab that I first joined as a student when I first came and uh, here and then I switched to what used to be the computer science lab and that was the lab I joined as I, I came as a faculty. What is the problem you are determined to address at this point in your career? I mean, that may be too simple a way to put it but you want to make an impact. You have a PhD, which has brought together some interesting ideas. What yeah, do you set as your? Task? I think it, you don't. You, so when you come as an assistant professor, I mean, it's it's a very high pressure and stressful job because okay. you know you are you are there for some amount of time, and if you don't get tenure, I mean, you're going right. to have a promotion. You don't get tenure, you get fired. Basically. Right. So it's very stressful. So for most people, the question is, how do I get tenure? And also at the same time doing what I'm, I'm interested in doing. Right. Um, so, so I was, so these, these were the two things. So on one hand, I have to always think, okay, I need to get tenure, which means that I need to publish. I need to have presence in my community. But at the same time, I, I'm interested in in science and um, the broader questions. Yeah, yes. new things, basically, yes. new ideas and new development, and the, that requires you to take a risk because I mean, when you are saying you are you are developing something new, you really have no idea whether it's gonna work or it's not gonna work right. or anything like that. So. So you have to take a lot of risks when you do something like this, but at the same time you don't want to take too much risk because you have yeah. you, you have you some... have to produce something tangible. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So you kind of like oscillate between these two things. Right. And you oscillate it in what direction? I mean, what what in your mind is the hope that you will, if not solve, contribute to at this point? Because in the end, it will yeah. lead to some very significant insights. But I'm yeah, but it's uh, again. I don't think that at least for me is is that yeah. Oh, I'm interested. At least at that stage, it's not. It wasn't like 
oh, I want to come up with the next idea in computer networks okay. or in... I just happen to get interested in certain ideas and... I mean, to some extent, I mean, you, you told me, I mean, like, this is a p profile on, uh, like, you looked at the paintings, oh, and yes. actually, I did these paintings when I was back in Syria, yes. when I was a teenager, and, and when you paint, I mean, you, you just, you're fascinated you by something, but you really don't know a priori how this thing is going to look like when when you finish same when you write a story for example Absolutely. it's not yeah you try to to put some plot but i mean at the end of the day the story writes itself sometimes and tell me the story that was written because i want to get you to some of your great insights how did we get there yeah so so i i was always interested in interdisciplinary work i yes. um yes. and I was very well positioned to do that because I mean I I have very strong background in in science of when I was uh, from my high school as I said it's like much much stronger and it's a very broad program than what you see here in the US and I did one year of med school I'm just like um, interested in medicine in general I have a um, strong background in math and applied math and I did my undergrad in electrical engineering I did my PhD in computer science right. also I have a breadth of knowledge that allows me to succeed in interdisciplinary work um, whether that was conscious or subconscious I don't know but it's just like there are the thing, these are the things that I like it's just like doing something that does not really require just knowledge in one, one area right. it requires so after so i did my phd as i said in in internet congestion control right. and then when i became a faculty i started uh, being interested in wireless systems wireless networks okay. and i guess i got lucky because also it was a good time for that because it was like okay it's the wi-fi was on the surge and everyone just connected starting to get connected via laptops and wi-fi and cellular networks were growing and um that was a good time to work on wireless so in wireless networks wireless is very different from the internet in the in the following sense mm -hmm. That, um, so when you have when you are talking about a wired network, then if if you want to communicate between this node and this node, you have to have a wire between them. Right. And when you have a wire between them, they communicate to each other. They don't affect other nodes that they don't right. have a wire with. Right. Okay. So that's very really different from wireless networks. Wireless networks, if you have a transmitter and it transmits to this particular receiver, but actually it's transmitting to everyone indirectly, like it's transmitting a signal in the environment. So you can't isolate the signal level from the protocol and the application. So it becomes very important that somebody understands both the signal and uh, which goes to what traditionally we call electrical engineering and also understand the protocols and applications which is typically in computer science um, looks like uh, again heaven for me is yeah. uh, the exactly what i like the kind of ideas that i can manipulate easily and move between all of these different things so i started working on designing new um, transmission system, new uh, networking protocols for, for wireless systems, for wireless networks like Wi-Fi or cellular. And uh, so that was the next stage in my career. And it was uh, successful to the point that got me through my promotion and right. um, I had uh, good success in it. Uh, then I, I get... Uh, uh, I uh, I don't like working on the same thing for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I I get bored quickly. Restless. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And then I started changing. I said, okay, so let's not let's think about wireless. I think about the signal and the ability of the signal to review things about the environment. Uh, so over the last um, maybe like six seven years i've been thinking about how can we use the wireless signal and its reflection from the environment and the people to try to 
understand people and environments and design new sensors. So we're leaving a narrow notion of this is available for communication only to a much wider con context. Context of motion, context of, as you said, the physical world yeah. and how it interacts. Are, are you alone in this or do you have a group of people working on, uh, these, on these wider issues? Yeah, so, I mean, of course I have my students, and some of them now are professors in, in other universities. Uh, so, when we started, it was something that not as many people thought of. I mean, they, I mean, if you think of it, I mean, it's just like thinking about what is the simplest system where you are looking at, or a, a very known system where you are looking at the interaction of a radio signal with the environment. It's radar, for example. So, in radar, you, you transmit a wireless signal, and you look at its reflection from maybe an airplane that is in the sky and you right. are detecting an airplane. So it's also an example. So, so there are multiple systems that uh, kind of use notions like that, mm -hmm. but it was new to try to use it to um, understand indoor environment, understand people. Um, we use it now to, to measure... Um, to, to design a simple, a simple uh, box that you can put at home, uh, like your Wi-Fi box, mm -hmm. but actually it can measure your breathing, your heartbeat, your gait, your sleep, without putting any sensors on your body, just like basically based on how so your I'm body... So medicine again. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so suddenly the, the reluctant doctor is beginning to come up with concepts that will have a profound effect on medical practice. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, exactly. So, my my uh, my current uh, passion is really bringing these notions to medicine and hopefully changing something in medicine. Because coming from a medical fam family and coming actually from from a country like Syria, which is an underdeveloped country, but mm -hmm. actually has pretty good um, medical school and uh, like a practice of medicine, um, it is disappointing to see how uh, like the, the way the, the healthcare system works in the US. Mm -hmm. So you, you really want to automate the healthcare system and that, that's, that's becoming actually very important uh, today, not just because okay, we want to automate everything, but actually because of a real issue. I mean, there are many people who are older and we don't have as many doctors and nurses and healthcare right, workers. Right. <coughs> so you, you really need a system that reduces the cost, be able to support uh, the aging population, and also at the same time be efficient, be good, and provide good, good outcomes for the patients. One of the things always asked about new ideas and technology uh, from outside, uh, where there's not a sophisticated understanding of it, is what are the dangers? Are there are there only benefits? Uh, what do you worry about in terms of the uses of this kind of insight? Yeah. So first, let let me let me Please. tell you a bit more about what is the insight and okay. how how we can use it, and then we can okay. talk about the danger. Right. So the insight is um, we we need to be able to, to monitor health, hopefully continuously at home, the same, I mean, you monitor uh, whether you have a fire at home all the time. Right, right. Um, so if we can have also like a health monitoring continuously in the environment, that would be great because I mean, in the US alone, there are about 13 million people who, who are seniors who live alone at home. Mm. So there's a big danger for those people. So if we, if we can monitor health continuously, like let's say heart and breathing, heartbeat, sleep of people, mobility, all of these questions that a doctor would ask you when you visit right. them and trying to figure out the health and being able to continuously monitor, then we can in many cases uh, predict, particularly now with all advancement in machine learning, we can predict things that look like they are leading to exacerbation and ask the doctor to intervene early. And in fact, in many diseases, such intervention can avoid hospitalization. 
which so, has economic as well as yeah, course, of course, uh, okay. medical benefits. Yes. Yeah, and then the question is, how do you do it? Now you can ask somebody to 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 live their life with sensors all over their body, <laughs> but that's that's not. Then maybe it's better just to take the risk. You don't want to live that right. such a life. Right. So, so the idea is to just use the surrounding wireless signal without asking people to change their behavior or start and doing diuresis. Right. Like, okay, today I slept at this hour and right. woke up at this hour and I woke up and and was five times at right. night. So because that's the only source of information the in, doctor has now. Yeah, in many cases. Yes. Yeah. So basically, being able to that's one like one of the major ideas that recently my lab here at MIT. Has been working on is just being able to use the surrounding the ambient wireless signal around people to measure things like breathing, heartbeat, mobility, gait, falls in the uh, in the elderly, yes. and just take that information and also try to predict changes in health and predict the future ch future changes and alert the doctor to them. Uh, so, so that's the vision that we are working uh, toward, and we we made so many uh, steps toward it, and so many advances. You feel quite close to that kind of realization. Now. Yes, yes, yes. We we are actually working with um, multiple medical doctors in different domains in. Um, Parkinson's, in mm. um, uh, Alzheimer and mm. dementia, and um, a variety COPD. And the the other end of the spectrum is with babies too. This yes. Way. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you definitely. That's uh, actually when I met uh, President Obama. <laughs> that was his comment. It's like, why don't you use it? You should use this for SIDS, for baby. Like, um, you know, babies right, can right. stop breathing, so, so you can just monitor that immediately. Yeah, so, so that's, that's the vision. Now your question is, what's the danger? Right. So um, I don't think that there is a safety danger from the wireless signal, because I mean, we are talking about wireless signals that are um, 100 to 1,000 times lower power than your Wi-Fi at home. So I mean, if you are comfortable with Wi-Fi, this is not going to be right. any danger for you. So, so the, then the, the real issue that we are talking about probably is privacy. It's like if, if somebody is monitoring continuously and getting all of this information, then how do you deal with privacy? And, and that's, that's a very big and important question. And in general, I think in all, all type of data that any system is getting about us, the people, uh, it should be... Um, it should be controlled by exactly the consent of the user, what we decide as user to let that system monitor. So the system should not monitor something that we wouldn't allow him to monitor. And then the output of the monitoring should also be controlled by us. So if I, if I say, okay, I'm, I'm allowing the system to monitor my, my sleep, uh, yes. fine, the system should not monitor other things, should monitor my sleep, and also the, the my sleep uh, quality and sleep stages and all of that information, it should be up to me to decide who get access to that information. So right. I might share it with my friends, I might share it with my doctor, right. it's up to me. So so these kind of things have to, have to be taken very seriously and we do take them seriously. Is there even a more nefarious, I, I, I don't, I'm not one to think about, that's really the dark, dark side of science, but the knowledge of what you can hear across boundaries, what, I mean, it, there's a lot more than just the medical knowledge that can come from these yeah, sensors. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not saying that you have the solution, but clearly society has to think about that. Yeah, so basically, um, yeah, for example, our sensors can be used um, to spy on people if right, you'd like, right. uh, but... Uh, it's the end of the wall. <laughs> in a way, but uh, we won't we won't over worry yeah. that right now. The excitement is in what can benefit us. Yeah, no, actually, I think we, we should worry, and we should uh, not worry in a negative sense. Worry in a positive sense. Every single technology, even your camera, like we we right. added cameras on cell phones, but somebody could take those cameras and start taking pictures of people in locker rooms, and that's not good and that's not what we expect these cameras to be used and, for. And my cell phone locates me. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, very easy in the in the outside world. No, we're already in that terrain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And from, from everything, even the car, I mean, a car could be, it's very, very uh, useful. Every one of us use cars, but also it could run people uh, that is uh, creating accidents and creating new danger. So it's all, uh, everything has to have certain uh, policies so that we can, we, we can leverage the good side of science and we can at the same time uh, prevent or try to to control any bad effect without stifling uh, innovation. That's the key. Um, as we come to the end of this, I'm going to ask uh, maybe an inevitable question. I hope it interests you. Uh, you were saying surprising to me, but I understand that in Syria, being a young woman was not an impediment to your pursuing your intellectual interest. Um, So here you are. I I was very struck by a photo I saw of you surrounded by your students, and there wasn't a single female. Now, this is a photo, but it looked like uh, the group of the students that you're working with on some of these issues. So again, the question is, is there now, do you take a more hopeful environment for the encouragement of scientific inquiry for young women, or is, are we still stuck, at least in this country, in gender-based assumptions? Um, so, I mean, you can look at the statistics, and the statistics, unfortunately, are not great. I mean, we see that the, the number of women um, in computer science yes. graduate, uh, that are doing graduate career, I mean, the last time I checked, it was even going down. But I mean, whether it's going down well, it's or steady, it's definitely not increasing. Right. It's not like it's at the level where you would like it to be. And you keep hearing, I mean, there are many stories recently. So, uh, I mean, I don't think that we are, we really achieved the level of diversity in our schools, in our work environment, in in the way we treat people, not just women, women right. and minority, uh, that you, we would like to have. Uh, but again, like going back to Barbara Leskov, yes. uh, who, who maybe was, I mean, either the first or one of the very first female to, to have a PhD in computer science. Right. I think we, we, we made major, major uh, advances since then. And my life as a female, female faculty computer scientist is much better than what she had to go through through her life. I, I, I was told that she was photoshopped into a picture of the faculty <laughs> because they forgot that they have a woman. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, so I, we're not there. Really. We, yeah, we're not there, but also it's we shouldn't ignore everything good that that has happened. I mean, it's definitely coming also from Syria, and it's a country underdeveloped country. I would say also, I mean, apart from from education, definitely women suffer a lot in in countries mm-hmm. like Syria. So we should be able to see the difference, but we should also say we are not there yet, and we would like to do better. Are you, do you have men, do you, in spite of the photo I saw, have a number of female uh, graduate students working with you? I have, not as much as uh, as I would like to have. Um, it seems that that particular photo I, which <laughs> was is, from a time when I didn't have a female in my, in my group, or maybe it, she was not there at that time. But as I said, I mean, it's one woman right. um, who graduated from my group. So yeah, I would like to see more. Um, but I think we really need to, to have more effort because it's, it's not really about, uh, like we, we don't have as many women that are in, entering that pipeline to start with, so exactly. you can't produce them in the middle of the pipeline. They, we have to, to uh, continue doing better at every level. And of course, unlike uh, the remarkable young woman you were, many people do need role models. Yeah, but okay. I'm I'm actually a bit different from most of the like m- many of the people here in the U.S. think that it's really yeah. I, I don't know how to describe it, but I think women 
I mean, so for example, just to give you a very, yes. maybe that would be a controversial thing to say, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you hear a lot about work-life balance in, in, in my world of things, and uh, that to, to get women into computer science, we need work-life balance. Oh, yeah. And to me, no, actually, that's not the case. It's, it's, it's really, you don't want to tell women that actually to, to succeed, they need uh, to have a balance because they have other duties that they have to do at home. Right. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to say everyone equal, everyone has equal opportunities. Yeah, if you have, are going to invest more in your career, you are going to hopefully receive more from that career. And as a woman or a man, you have to, to, to have that ambition and to have, you have to be aggressive. And uh, so I, I actually think that it is more important to tell women to be aggressive, to, to fight for their rights uh, and to uh, not to, uh, to wait until somebody, someone gives them, I mean, it's not about uh, life work balance. I mean, if you want to succeed, I mean, you have seen the nerds and the weirdos that succeed <laughs> in our field. Right. So it's, uh, you have to, to you, you don't have a balance, but that's not a reason for a woman not to be successful in the right. field. So maybe the achievement can come from removing the barriers, but not necessarily cons creating a paradise of, of conditions. Exactly, removing the barriers, um, telling, I mean, the, the worst thing that I've seen in the US, these stickers are actually, um, I'm too pretty for math. I mean, when you start yeah. that way, when, right, when, you, right. when you condition the, the human brain and attitude in this way, I mean, you're never going to succeed. You, those people will never succeed eventually because, I mean, mass and uh, mass business, everything. I mean, basically, whatever that is, is requires a person who's really focused, who knows what they want and who are going to, to be a go-getter. Thank you very much. <laughs>